Ginger, thank you for the uh, great introduction and uh, th thanks for having me here. I guess more importantly, uh, I hope you all leave uh, this session with something you can use. Uh, so let's try to do that. Um, let me say, um, when I was first approached um, with this, uh, this idea of, of talking about marketable skills, my first response uh, to Ginger politely was, I don't know a thing about marketable skills. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I, here's what I do. And it was the sort of things that Ginger just talked about in introducing me. I do a lot of testing personnel selection in college settings in, in, for corporations in military settings. And I deal with school to work transition, as she said. Um, but I'm not quite sure um, I deal with marketable skills. And she reassured me that, um, in fact, I am a good fit, that, uh, um, that, in fact, what we're trying to do here, and you can correct me, please, if I'm wrong, is to uh, determine how skills uh, that are uh, taught in the educational setting get translated into the workplace in a way that um, where the sender, the educators, um, and the students who carry these skills with them, and the receivers, the employers, or the industries, right, because there are industry kind of groups, and everyone sort of needs to be on the same page in understanding these skills, right? It's, it's not good if you have a student armed with skills and they hit a dead end or they have limited options because those who could receive and really want to receive can't receive because there's a lack of translation, right? And uh, so um, the, the supply should meet demand as, as good as possible for the sake of everyone involved. Does that, does that sort of chime with what you want to talk about here? Is that, I see some nods. You can hold your applause. Um, <laughs> but um, I guess what I'd like is a conversation more than me lecturing like I do at Rice about what your concerns are. And what I'll say before we get started um, is I think what I can do for you is um, think about the bases that you're approaching marketable skills from in terms of your own, certainly your needs, right? Your stakeholders, your students, your boss, whatever the pressures are to, to uh, produce uh, the practical needs. Um, but then also the perspective of, you know, how would a, um, how would a researcher help you make the right decision, right? So um, in, in other words, what I, what I hopefully can help prevent is the idea that you get something from a vendor who tells you how great their product is, right? There are bells and whistles and, oh, there's, yed, there's red, yellow, green that can help you make decisions. Oh, good. Well, that, that is good if it's good, right? If I could give random red, yellow, greens, and you can make decisions right away on a smooth dashboard and, and mission accomplished in some sense, right? But there should be an engine behind that, not a random number generator, right? So how does, how does research speak to that? How, how, how have researchers tried to get at some consistency behind marketable skills, um, both in terms of the substance, so how do we measure and understand these skills, and that's where I'll hear from you about what skills are important, um, and how do, we, how do we translate the substance of those skills into measurement, into data, and then into these systems that help you make not just decisions, but reliable decisions. So that's, that's kind of, you know, your practical needs is one base, uh, my, what I can offer as a researcher is another base. Um, there's also your friends, right? Because it does take a village to make this happen. So whether it's IT or policy at various levels, um, you know, these are all experts. They're all stakeholders. They all have their own um, agendas in a way. They all interact. But again, the base I don't want you to rely on, the reason we have all these other bases, is so you're not looking at a vendor's catalog and saying, sounds good to me. It might be good, but you need to know what the right questions are to ask your vendor and make sure things are, things are sound for you, given your priorities. So them just saying it's sound in a blanket sense doesn't work, right? It needs to work for you. So let's, let's talk about that. All right, enough of me. I said I wasn't going to lecture. I just did. So um, how about you all 
offer what you think about. Why are you here? What are you thinking about when you think of marketable skills? It'll, it'll, it'll help orient me and it'll help orient us uh, working together. Any, any ideas? Yeah. So for context, this, this is from a two-year school that uh, has been primarily CTE just recently in the last uh, three years added an academic transfer degree. So the marketable skills that, that come to mind are what I hear from industry all day long, which I think there was a quote earlier, which is that they, they hire for technical skills, they fire for soft skills or marketable skills. Right. And so it's those, those things that are not part of our CTE curriculum, but that we spend a lot of our time talking to the students about and reinforcing. Right. Okay. So those are two big buckets that certainly resonate with my research, technical skills and soft skills. And uh, as Bridget, uh, as Ginger had noted, sorry, uh, that uh, I've been involved in these uh, National Academies committees that are concerned with the broader range of what these skills are. So what does it mean, you know, beyond book learning, which is certainly essential, right? You have to get a degree. You better pass those technical substantively oriented classes. And then beyond that, how do we build these skills that are beyond that? So how do we build the interpersonal skills, the teamwork, uh, the communication? Uh, how do we build the intrapersonal, the within person skills, like your, your ethics, your conscientiousness, your time management, right? Um, what are skills you need just to uh, stay engaged in school? So for example, uh, we, we wrote a recent chapter on first generation students looked at that literature and it showed that, um, you know, there are some interventions where, um, you know, a sense of belonging matters, whether that's to the institution or whether it's to the uh, kind of the, your uh, demographic similarity. Everyone likes people like them and everyone also likes a diverse environment. And having that right balance and uh, being mindful of that balance is really important in a college setting. Um, also, kind of having the big picture of what college is about. It, it, it sounds pretty abstract, but there's been research showing that if you let people know, particularly first-generation college students, that, um, you know, yes, you're going into engineering, you're learning these formulas, and uh, the technical stuff matters for you to get a job. That's the low level. It's not low, but it's here's the instrumental level. That's going to get you the job. But it turns out an intervention where you say, look, you're not just learning formulas, you're helping communities, you're building, you're literally building bridges, um, you're helping the world. Those types of interventions seem to work particularly, not just work, it does work overall, but it seems to work particularly for uh, women in STEM fields, underrepresented minorities. No solution is a cure-all, right? You have to constantly work on the nature of these interventions. You have to, it's not a one-shot deal, but um, these sorts of interventions then help to um, help students to persist, help students to engage in the technical work. So, and I, I emphasize that because, you know, technical and not technical, they're not separate things. I'm giving an example where the non-technical is helping you with the technical, right? It's giving you the energy, the fuel, to persist, to continue in your, in your school. So anyway, that's, that's hugely important. Constantly researched. Other marketable skills, interests? You're at this conference. <laughs> um, what, what is on your mind? What is, uh, yeah? Um, I just would like to uh, understand how emotional intelligence and um, the IQ, you know, translates into what we're trying to do with marketable skills. Ah, okay, interesting. That's a challenging question. <laughs> it's a big question. It's an important question. So, um, and I think it resonates with the prior point about, um, you know, IQ and EQ, I guess, right? Emotional skills. And how do those two work together? Um, I don't like anyone, I don't have the right answer uh, to this, but what I can say is there's certainly a literature, right, on the IQ side. It's over a century. And it shows that um, those who do score higher on tests of ability 
and we can get into a lecture on what that is. But whatever it is, um, if you score higher on those measures, that will predict uh, a greater likelihood, no guarantees, but a greater likelihood of success in scholastic domains. Okay? Um, ability itself, though, can be divided into um, you know, something really general like spatial reasoning. Right? Can you, does this uh, shape look like this shape when you rotate it? It's not very relevant. It's not directly relevant to school, right? But that is a test of ability, is, is that kind of spatial reasoning, fluid reasoning. Um, but then there's the more knowledge-based aspect of intelligence. And uh, researchers will call that crystallized intelligence. But it means the knowledge you're gaining over time. And in some sense, if you're talking about ability predicting performance in that way, it's no surprise there's a relationship. Gee, the more you know, the more you know, or the more you can use that knowledge, right, in the workforce or whatever. Your performance will be better because you know more stuff, right? So on the ability side, people have thought about these sorts of uh, relationships for a long time. And, you know, it's important to know that even if you don't give the test, even if you don't give the SAT, that doesn't mean that um, you know, the scores they would have had is still predictive of their outcomes, right? It just, you, just didn't, you just didn't pick it up. So I, what I would say is, on that side, it's still important to have some information. I'm not saying the SAT, but some information about their knowledge, their, their ability. OK, let's go to the EQ side. The EQ side is a um, very broad domain. So these models of emotional intelligence, they have multiple dimensions they might call factors, right? Some, I, I don't know which ones concern you, but you know, generally we're concerned about um, students that get along, have interpersonal skills, that are able to regulate their own emotions, right? Show some self-control. And it's not just to have a uh, good classroom, but of course that's a good thing. It's also because you're building a muscle, right? You're, you're hopefully those muscles are gonna be strong enough so that when you're in the workforce, you are able to exercise self-control. You a are able to exercise, uh, understand people's feelings, so empathy for others, right? Working on teams, and not just understanding empathy, but also then knowing to how to respond to it. So there, there are tests that are kind of more in the interpersonal skills domain. Um, I've been involved in a, in a test that, uh, it's called a situational judgment test, where um, students are involved in the development of the test, actually. They help come up with the scenario material, and then we narrow down the themes and create items. We correct their spelling, and we uh, then create these tests. And they also generate the responses, so, um, you know, they give a bunch of responses and, and uh, we narrow those down. And then we develop a key. So basically, when you take the situational judgment test, you see these situations, or really short, like paragraph-ish stories. And then you see these responses and one form of the test would say, um, rate each response on their effectiveness. So this, you know, uh, uh, somebody confronts you at recess and, and says they have a problem with you, but doesn't, they don't explain what the problem is. So one response might be, you know, ask what the problem is. Another one might be, you know, run for your life. Uh, another one might be, you know, engage in a conversation and try to defuse the confrontation or things. So there's no real right answer, but they get keyed against uh, certain groups, and I won't get into the details there. But what I will talk about is how those tests will um, predict above and beyond ability and intelligence. And, and what's interesting in our research is we thought, well, of course it's going to predict for interpersonal outcomes. You know, if you can get people's uh, measures of their engagement in school or uh, peer ratings of their teamwork or getting along, yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have some prediction there, of course. But what surprised us is it even predicted above and beyond ability when GPA was the criterion, grade point average. How does that work? So I don't know. Maybe it has to do with, um, you know, regulating your emotions probably matters when you take tests as well, right? We talk about test anxiety. 
right? How do you manage test anxiety? And, and there, there's a lot behind this be, um, beyond just tests. I create tests. There are other researchers that uh, dig deeper in the sense of how do I, uh, what are the train, so there are training experts that work with me at Rice. So like, how do you train interpersonal skills? I don't know. I, I don't, I have guesses, but I don't do that. Um, but, you know, whatever they're teaching in that training, that, that seems to be the type of things that uh, students are doing when they are able to respond to the situational judgment test and say, that situation is effective and that situation is not. And that ends up predicting student engagement, but then it predicts GPA as well. Not massively, but like three to 4% of what's called the variance. But if you think of variance as like the amount of stuff we're trying to predict, right? Differences in, in students' GPA. And uh, if I could perfectly predict, then that's 100% of the variance. Well, no one's ever gonna do that. Because first of all, these measures have something called measurement error, right? So when a test is less reliable, the fancy way of saying it has more measurement error. So a more reliable test has less measurement error. And so, um, by the way, that might be something you wanna ask a vendor. How reliable are your measures um, when they're trying to sell you a measure? Um, so if zero is something doesn't predict at all and 100 is perfect, you know, and, and, and we're, even, um, we're not even giving uh, interpersonal skills a full chance because we're saying it has to predict above and beyond ability. So it can't, you know, uh, before you get to predict interpersonal skills, ability gets to predict first, right? And if, and if interpersonal skills were redundant, then there'd be nothing for interpersonal skills to predict, right? So what I'm saying is if, if I let ability predict first and then I let interpersonal skills come in, it's about four or five percent, three to five percent of the variance. It's good and it's stubborn. It predicts in, in a good way. Stubborn in a good way. No matter what sample we fire it at, interpersonal skills, um, ethics, we, 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 we have a bunch of different dimensions uh, from our uh, situational judgment test. We'll predict above and beyond GPA most often. Um, and actually, this might be a good segue into um, some of the dimensions we've looked at. And let me say that, um, oops, not that one. Um, so people, people say, oh, emotional intelligence is um, old wine and new bottles. All you did was you took interpersonal skills and self-regulation and you know, whatever else there is there and uh, put it under this EQ label. That might be true. Um, I don't always think that's bad. Right? If you're paying attention to these constructs because I called it EQ, that's fine. I, you know, that's what I like about my job as an industrial organization psychologist is I translate what we do, what nerds do in the basement of Rice to what people, the language people use. And they're not, you're not talking, you know, when you say emotional intelligence, you're not throwing out a random junk word. You're talking about the same things we are. We just don't translate sometimes. So... I'm all for EQ or soft skills, whatever you want to call it. Um, and to break down those soft skills a little more, I just wanted to show you some research we've been doing for the past 10 years off and on. More on, uh, let's say about six years ago, for, for about six years straight, we were developing measures. Um, I'll try here, there we go. So, um, what my colleagues did, this is when I was teaching at Michigan State University, um, is we took college mission statements and we, um, we broke them down. We, we, uh, we chopped up the, the statements into pieces and we said, um, we wanna know what colleges want to get out of their student body. And if what they're saying, if they believe what they're saying <laughs> is, is, is their mission, then we should be able to chop up mission statements and extract themes from them. So we did that. We took a mission statement, took what they said. We, we, we looked at far and wide across the web and, uh, and printed materials. We weren't, we weren't necessarily um, exhaustive of all the colleges and two-year systems and so on, but, but we were pretty uh, representative, I would say. We looked at college mission statements 
We looked at the educational liter literature. We spoke with folks who are in residence life. We spoke with advanced college students, and by that I mean not just students who had high GPAs, but a student who just makes it through college, I would view as advanced, right? They didn't, they made it. They, they haven't dropped out. They're persisting. And so we got that sample as well. And we asked them, you know, what are the types of things that you find valuable to the college experience? What do you find being really important in terms of residence life? Um, and, we, and, oh, we also spoke with folks in uh, health, in the, uh, like, uh, Student Services Center who are, are dealing with medical uh, issues, both mental health and physical health. And so after all that work, we came up with these, uh, these dimensions. So uh, 12 dimensions. And, uh, you know, we have shorter labels now. But basically, you know, the first two dimensions, now these are, you'd say, dimensions of college success. The first two dimensions are actually even, I would say just the first dimension, deals with GPA, right? So out of 12 dimensions, only one of them is directly related to GPA. So, so that's a preview, right? The whole world is much, much bigger. And that's, right, so you got to learn something. There's knowledge. You can write that down. you got to learn something. Um, and then the second dimension, it, yes, it's knowledge, but it's proactive knowledge. It's, it's learning. It's, it's, it's the students that want to, uh, they're intellectually curious. They go out, they get more information because they want to know. And I'd say that is a huge, when I look at my graduate students at Rice, that is a huge dimension to their success. Um, I let them know that. I'm like, you know, what differentiates students that are working with me? They're the ones that are, their engines are going in terms of things they're interested in. It doesn't have to be what I'm interested in. In fact, it, you know, it's better if it, it's their own, not totally separate, but overlaps. You know, they benefit from me, but then they're going in their own direction. That's kind of what going toward the PhD is about. Uh, but even in, in high school, in middle school, having that intellectual curiosity, maybe especially in those years, right? If, you, if you've raised kids, like the early years are the formative years, right? What you choose then puts you in the right uh, or different directions. Um, and so intellectual curiosity is there. Um, artistic came up in our, as a theme, art and culture. Um, whether you're, you know, it doesn't have to be expertise, right? It can, you don't have to be an expert artist uh, to, to score high on an artistic dimension. It just means being open to those experiences. Maybe even if it's not your favorite thing, but just being open to those experiences because having a broader view of the world helps you grow, right? Helps you figure out your journey as a student. Uh, multicultural appreciation, showing openness, um, sometimes tolerance, right? Sometimes you have to get started somewhere, and that's where some people have to start. But really, an openness and appreciation for other cultures, it, it can be people, it can be art, it can be food. But it's, it's uh, you know, not being the opposite. The, the converse would be being tuned out, right? Just being, being closed uh, to the world. And so when opportunities arise, you take advantage of them. And so by describing it that way, it reminds me that these dimensions are not independent, right? They're not, we, we talk about them independently because it's easier, right? One, two, three, four through 12. But the world's more complicated than that. So, you know, if you have, intellectual curiosity, that probably ties into multicultural appreciation, that you're willing to investigate. Oh, that's something new. I'd like to meet that person. They have a different background. Uh, I can learn. Maybe they learn from me. Um, you know, that kind of thing. And, and institutions should foster that. Fred, yeah. if I may uh, interject, because um, I'm really interested in how you've presented this uh, from the lens of marketable skills, because I had oh. not actually thought about using this kind of work yeah. to inform, or even as a starting point for identifying marketable skills. Because um, you had asked in the back a really good question, like how does emotional um, intelligence play into marketable skills? So if you started with a list like this, or if you broke down emotional intelligence in cert into certain keywords, um, it'd be a really interesting exercise to try and crosswalk that if you go back to the um, folder where you can see the list of the um, possible vendors 
um, it would be really interesting to use that labor market information, the data available in, in several of, of, of those um, data sets, to try to match that, those kinds of qualities to what's being asked for by employers. And so one of the reasons uh, Fred was talking to you about how to have a conversation with your vendor is that this idea of using labor market information, unfortunately, the world as it is now, all of the really rich labor market information is available through purchase. Um, even the, t the Texas Workforce Commission data uh, in terms of employment is, is, is a data source you have to purchase. But looking at job postings data, so if you were at the keynote, Peter Stokes talked about burning glass. And that is a license that you have to purchase. Fred has had several conversations with MZ. Again, that's a license you have to purchase. Um, Texas State Technical College is building Calibrate, but eventually that will be a product that you would purchase. Um, so really being, uh, understanding that there are data sources out there for you, um, that's part of what we, why we wanted to have this conversation with you today so that you are more knowledgeable when you go as a uh, potential client and you interface with one of these vendors to try to find out how they can meet your needs. So, for example, using the research that Fred was just showing you and crosswalking that to some of these data might really give you um, a benchmark to start building out your marketable skills. Um, what, uh, UT Tyler, is anyone here from UT Tyler? So they, they did a really an interesting exercise. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm interjecting here. No, no, this is great. This is great. We're um, going there anyway, so... Uh, UT Tyler did a really interesting exercise with burning glass. So they came to the Marketable Skills Conference in 2016, and their career services person and uh, dean of one of their colleges were really excited about the Marketable Skills Gold. They were one of those institutions who felt like this is a chance for us to really shine and show how we're unique from other institutions. They already had a license with burning glass. But burning glass, their data at the time really just showed you, here's all the labor market, here are all the job postings in your area. Here's the kind of skills they're asking for in your area. But you had to look at those skills job by job. Well, UT Tyler invested staff time over a year and a half to aggregate all of those by meta major. So if you go to the UT Tyler Career Services site, you'll see the, the fruits of their labor. And it's very interesting to see what they did. You want to do that? They built out, yeah, if you could be terrific. They built out, you know, as I said, aggregate data by meta major based on the skills available through burning glass. Uh, Burning Glass is now trying to automate that process so each institution doesn't have to do that so that they can aggregate up those skills for you. But again, that is a vendor that you'd have to buy a license for. You'd have to, to engage their services. What was really interesting in that process is that, um, you know, the career services folks are really happy with what they've done. They have really rich information available. The dean who went to the Marketable Skills Conference was really excited with the work that they had done and the time that they had invested and thought that they had a really great start on the Marketable Skills Goal. So the dean took what career services had done. They went to faculty and said, look, I think we're done. I think we're done with the marketable skills goal. We took all the skills from the job postings. Boom. And the faculty were like, wait a minute. We need to talk. This is great, but there are some skills in those job postings that don't align directly to our curriculum. So we can't claim that we're teaching our students those skills. Also, there's a lot we are teaching that aren't in these job postings, and we shouldn't overlook those. Those should remain, you know, one of the marketable skills that we're teaching, even if they're not in demand right now in the workforce. Because as we talked about this morning, over time, your students are going to need to repackage their skills. So a skill that's not in high demand right now may very well be critical in the next five years, and you don't want to overlook that. So, you know, again, what we want to, we just want to have a conversation with you today to help you think about using the data tools that are available to you, uh, being a conscientious um, client when you interface with a vendor and what kind of data you can use or what kind of help they can offer you. Don't be afraid to be demanding because quite frankly, you know, these vendors are aware of the marketable skills goal. They're working towards reaching it and serving, serving you as their clients. Um, and as you've heard from so the keynotes today, this is a national and international conversation. So again, don't be afraid to be demanding. <laughs> yeah. And if the vendor doesn't do what you need them to do, tell them they need to fix that. 
Um, MZ is another great, uh, actually, Fred, you're in a much better position to talk about what MZ can do for sure. marketable skills because you had a couple of conversations with them. Um, we, I will tell you an uh, interesting story. So the coordinating board had a, a license with MZ to um, do some work on a, on a specific grant. But while we had the license, we asked them, hey, uh, we already have your data. Can we, can we dive in and see what's available in terms of marketable skills? And they said, sure, go ahead. And so we did some diving and we created some, some aggregate information and we went back to them and said, look, this is, can, this is great. Can we share this with our institutions? And MC said, you know what, that is great. But now you're bumping up against our business model. Yeah. Because this is, a, this is a service we could give directly to our clients and we, rather than having it be state level, we could actually focus it on their region and their local workforce demand. So MZ, while very appreciative of the work we were doing, you know, we had to be respectful of their business model and their, their licensure agreements. So, you know, again, you as the client, uh, if, in my opinion, that just position, positions you even better to ask for more from these vendors who have these job postings data. Um, but, you know, some of the things we've learned is really it's got to be an ongoing conversation with your with whomever you're providing you the data, whether that be a vendor or if you're doing it by hand, which I I don't recommend. But you know if you you mm. may you may decide to go that route. It was an incredible learning process for UT Tyler. Um, so have an ongoing conversation with whomever is providing the data to you. Have an ongoing conversation with your faculty because again, it has to be. It's not just a one-way street where the jobs posting data and the skills available in the job postings data are telling you what the marketable skills are that you're offering. It, it's not. That's just a signal from the workforce of what's being valued right now. Maybe you're teaching 80% um, of that, of those skills, and that's fantastic. But the other 20%, you know, you're teaching skills that, that right now job employers aren't asking for. And that can lead you to a conversation with your industry partners. They probably still really want those skills. They're not just putting them in their job posting because they think they're inherent. Well, we want to make them explicit so that your students, again, are in the best position possible to market themselves. So um, these are some of the uh, skills that came out of MZ. And Fred, I'll let you talk to this and what, um, what the conversation you had with MZ was about what, what they can do. Sure. Okay, well, let me, um, let me tie on uh, to what Ginger was talking about here in terms of translation. I think, um, so if you stare at the left there, I couldn't help but keep my research uh, poking out. Um, so, uh, you know, in terms of what uh, colleges claim to value in their mission statements, we're dealing with intellectual skills, interpersonal skills, and then within person. How do you manage yourself in terms of your career, your physical health? your perseverance, your ethics, and so on. And uh, I guess what I'd say tied to Ginger's comments is that sometimes we don't recognize those skills are being developed and they, they, they don't translate onto the resume, right, for what the employer is looking for, right? And so the reason I think these frameworks are useful, it's not because we uh, don't know they exist. We know teamwork matters, right? We know we know that physical health matters, et cetera. We know ethics matters. I guess that's a better example, ethics. Um, but uh, we need to think about where are those appearing in your curricula, right? And so recognizing that and saying, oh, I can translate that into the resume. This was actually taught, right? We actually learned about ethics in the workplace when it comes to dealing with data or dealing with other people. And, uh, and, and Feature those prominently to the extent you see that connection from, so it's like from the curriculum to the resume to what the employer is saying in the posting and perhaps to the employer to the extent you have a relationship with your employer and a lot of institutions do have these employer relationships. So, you know, there's that whole pipeline um, and, you know, getting the employer to be on the same page as you is a two-way street, right, to help inform how you shape your not just your curricula, but then that translation process uh, to help your students be successful at work. That's what these companies are trying to do, trying to hand that to you to give you those tools that get you the translation, trying to bring the market to you, or at least market information that helps students uh, either find jobs or at least make valuable predictions about the areas they should explore uh, in terms of their future success. That's what they're trying to do. 
And so um, I, think, I think what Ginger was talking about is kind of laying out that pipeline. And what I was doing here in terms of the research landscape was just saying, look, here's the wide range of marketable skills we have here. It's not just one thing. It's not, but it's not so many things, right, that, that these things can have so many labels. But we really were exhaustive in searching mission statements, the educational literature, and we basically found 12. You can split hairs and say, what about this and what about that? Like I might add, uh, I could add time management, for example. I think that's a really important skill, right? And so you, you definitely would add, add things of your own. But the important thing is to have that list. Just like, you know, you might forget the guacamole if you didn't put it on the grocery list, right? You're a smart person. You'd think you'd remember the guacamole, but you still have to have a list so that you, you can remember, right? So that's what frameworks are useful for, is so that you can remember. And also so your peers are on the same page, right? So, so when you all say you're interested in marketable skills or you're all interested in soft skills, or even if you said you're all interested in emotional intelligence, you may not all be interested in the same thing, right? So in terms of shared goals, uh, these frameworks can be helpful. So establish a framework for your skills and then see how that overlaps with uh, what vendors have to offer. Um, so as Ginger noted, I, I've had a couple conversations with MC uh, in terms of the products they offer. Um, what's being focused on here, let's uh, look at the top. It's basically showing what are, what are top skills found um, in industry and how are those skills, are those skills being taught uh, in the, oh, this is not that chart. So this is, this is job postings versus uh, what the workforce seems to want. And you can see some parallels here. They actually cautioned me not to compare these two things, even though they're right next to each other. They're like, oh, don't, the metrics don't exactly line up, don't do subtraction or whatever. But at the same time, you can see that um, there are a lot of job postings dealing with uh, management skills, you get an MC report, it's give, you request the job that you want, and then it's going to give you all the market information tied to that. So you can get, you can get a bunch of reports like this. I was going to say a billion, but actually uh, the ONET, um, the, the structure for providing occupational information that they depend on is called the ONET. It's a Department of Labor uh, resource. Actually, their resources are free. They, they have some exploration tools. So if you go to... Um, onetcenter.org, I think, or if you just Google Onet, um, you'll get some of these tools. There's free data there, but it's not in a friendly mode. That's what these folks do, is they, they make the data more friendly. Actually, me and my grad students at Rice, we're not there yet, but we're creating tools to make it uh, more friendly as well. So you'll have to wait. Um, I'll come back uh, in a few years and give, give away the, uh, everything we do. So... Um, you've got uh, completions, you've got institutions, so whether programs are offered at a distance or not can be really important, right, uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, if you're rural, if you're disabled, um, there, there are reasons to worry about distance. You even have uh, regional information, so what institutions are offering uh, the associates uh, in, in this uh, information sciences. But not only that, what is the growth, right? What is the growth for each institution? So it gives you you know, either a general forecast, if you look down the column and see red, it's like, oh, this is, there's a downtrend here, or you see all green, but then also specifics if you have institutional specific, you're at that institution, or you have those preferences, um, or a student wants to know, those types of things. Um, so trend data, you can request the regions through MC, you get this. Um, on the right there, the five to one, that deals with, um, they have an index they use a lot called posting intensity. And what posting intensity is, it, it's not a perfect index, but what it tells you is um, when they create a new job posting, um, how many times is that posting uh, getting floated out there? So the ratio of how many postings are out there to the number of unique postings is posting intensity. So if I have like, two job postings, and I post those a thousand times, you know, it, the ratio is a thousand over two, right? We can do that, right, in this room. Um, and so that'd be 500, but here it's five to one for this particular uh, piece of data. So they have, it's not, again, it's not a perfect index, right? If you're, it could be that you're, you're, you're desperate to fill a position, could be that you have a whole lot of positions, you just have to keep posting over time. There are a lot of reasons to keep posting. 
um, but that's one index. Hourly earnings, uh, jobs in terms of absolute numbers, uh, openings, and then change over time. And there's national level as well. So, so that's one thing to keep in mind with these tools is that regional is interesting, um, but you know how mobile is the person is important. How mobile is the student? And also how you know how widespread is the job regionally, right? So can, if the preference is where a student can or 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 wants to go, maps onto where the where the jobs are, that's great. So you could you could get a broader heat map of job availability and and get a sense of preference and match those things up. Uh, but here we have local information. Um, now you have it not just by institution. Now you also have it on the employer side, right? In terms of posting intensity. Um, actually, on the right, sorry. Oh, you do have posting intensity, but you also have unique postings over time. So it's kind of like the stock market for each, uh, for each place. Here's city of Houston, a bit of a downtrend and then level. Um, there's, no, there's no Y axis. It's really just giving you, it's giving you an impressionistic sense. You, 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 you get a sense from the ratio over here in terms of uh, the denominator there. It's the unique posting. So like for... I lost my line number. Oh, for City of Houston, you have 67 postings. So that's kind of at the end of the line here. So that the uptrend there is something more than 67, you see a decrease. So you kind of have to integrate the data and put it all together. But at least you get, you get a pretty good longitudinal picture that um, you wouldn't get otherwise. Um, you know, one question you could ask is, um, how reliable are these lines? And I guess the answer, without doing formal statistics, is you know don't trust these lines. If you saw like ten, that'd be a you know the bouncing would be a lot. It'd be huge. But you know from what I see here, it's like every line is I'd say pretty reliable, right? As far as its trend, it's it's a reasonable reasonable guess as what's going on. So this goes on for a while. Um, then you go from uh, employer to titles. You get a similar kind of setup. Now we have hard skills. And this is where, I mean, you think about this yourselves in, in education, where um, there's, a, there's a balance we think about in education and the workforce as far as general versus specific, right? So you could have technical training, learn to use Excel and Tableau, right? That's pretty specific. That'll get you jobs in many places. Um, but what happens when those go away, right? Can people retrain and transfer? Is that a, you know, that's a, that's a question. So do you want to invest in something that's going to go away tomorrow, right? Do you want to invest in technical training and then a robot comes along and takes your job away? That's, that is a definite concern. I've been on these conferences on the future of work where we worry about that. Because whether you're an educator or you're an employer, you know, you invest in training, you invest in the employee, you invest in the student. Um, you, you want that to be secure. And so I just, I'm just pointing out a sympathy I have with you as, you as you work with this is, you know, there's general training. We want students to have critical skills. We want students to have leadership, right? And uh, that goes along with broad college mission statements. But then in terms of the more technical training, you know, Excel, Tableau, um, I would argue that the more soft skills, right, are more transferable. But the hard skills, sometimes we don't know. And, uh, and so that, I think that factors into the placement issue. And it factors into the employment. You know, is the employer, that's a trend you saw for an employer uh, in the previous slides. But how long is that trend going to continue given whatever the future work throws our way? You, sometimes you never know. Oil and gas took a hit, right? And, and that kind of thing uh, can happen in every industry. Um, Okay, we talked about hard skills um, and how often those skills appear in the profiles uh, comes next. So like for particular jobs, um, do they contain these hard skills? How much of those skills? Um, and so that's what's going on here with these jobs. So it's sort of like a saturation index, like how, how heavy are these particular uh, skills within uh, jobs like information systems or telecommunications, uh, network switches. So you can see they're meant, the skills are mentioned a lot for information systems. They're mentioned relatively little for Java, maybe because Java is a very, right, it's a programming language. It's a, it's a very specific need. But information systems, 
is a very is a broader term, right? It's going to pull in different skills. Um, it's not going to. What this doesn't tell you is, you know, some jobs might list all the skills. We need it all from you. We'll pay you for it, but we need it all. Other ones might only list, like for the the information systems, one one job might list one hard skill. Another job for information systems might list three others, right? You still you don't know. It's still covering all the bases, but um, you don't know whether all the skills are in there. So the devil is in some of the details, but this gives you a broader view of, okay, these are broad job postings, broad skills, and then these are narrow skills. And if Java goes away, maybe what you learned will transfer. So there is some risk for going specific, but there's also some reward because an employer might really need that right now, right? And there's a lot of need for it or it wouldn't pop up. So that's sort of the balance. So specific skills here. Hey, time management is on there um, down here, uh, eight or 10 down there. Microsoft Office, verbal communication. That the, and by the way, verbal communication we found is you know, a soft and a hard skill, right? You have to be able to express yourself clearly, and there are ways to learn that. Uh, but then you also have to, you have to have the soft skills of making eye contact and if people don't understand to repeat yourself or to say it a different way. Um, so they, these soft and hard skills are related. Critical thinking. I, I can't tell you how many meetings I've had trying to figure out what critical thinking is. <laughs> it's so broad. And usually the answer we come up with is it's another test. Let's give another test. We'll figure out what critical thinking is that way. Um, no, no easy answers for those, those skills. Certifications, I mean, uh, maybe some of you deal with this more than others as far as uh, very specific certifications. And that has other issues, right, in terms of um, licensure and state rules and regulations and, and you know, going along a professional path that is sometimes well-trodden, uh, sometimes not without politics. Um, and sometimes these certifications compete with each other as well. But um, here you go in terms of lists of those. Um, and then appendices, so you can see exactly what they did. There's one appendix there. So that's MC. Um, and they've offered to me to uh, explore their, their data more. And th th that's the information they provided me. I don't know, Ginger, what would you like to see next? What do you think is useful here? We can take questions. Um, well, I. This is a really useful overview um, for me because I haven't dug into an MC report. I just would like to emphasize that we're not um, promoting MC necessarily no. because um, there are other vendors out there. We we're using MC as an example here because circum as circumstances as they were, uh, we were able to to get them on the phone and to work with Fred to help us with the presentation. But Burning Glass is also working on similar data. That. And yeah. okay, that would be great to to share some of that too. But um, it might be useful to help you think about these, you know, again, the job postings data, that's just the starting point. It's got mm -hmm. to, to lead into a conversation with your faculty. Um, but this could be really helpful if you just don't know where to start. If you really are just sort of at a loss on how to get the conversation started, this could be a tool. But you know your campus, you know your faculty. Um, is this a place to start to help them think it through, or is this a non-starter to make them upset because you're using job postings data. Uh -huh. I mean, seriously, I mean, you, this may not work for you if you know your faculty are not going to appreciate this. But for some, they might really appreciate a place to start. But again, it is just a place to start because you have to have that conversation. Um, we can take a couple of questions, and then um, I'd love to see how people um, uh, work, through, work through the exercise. Yeah, yeah. Um, we might need to consolidate tables so you're not working on your own. Maybe even some insight, not just a place to start for faculty, but administration as well, because sometimes we're looking, we are looking at MC, but not to share with the faculty, just to, to keep internally and, you know, I, you know, institutional effectiveness data and so on. So how do we get that conversation just as a campus as well, not just with faculty? Is that a question? Are you? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, uh, Fred, do you have any ideas or would you like me to try to? Um, Having the question with faculty and with students, is that the question? Like uh, how, is that how you would expand it? How would or? you use the MZ data, for example, just to have an internal conversation with other administrators? Oh, I see. Um, I think 
Well, we, we, we often aren't talking to each other, right? At least uh, I, that's a common theme I see, where if you get people in the room, and, and at least as a starting point, so they're not, they're not looking at these databases initially, but have a conversation about um, the kind of mentoring they're doing uh, with students, the needs that are getting expressed, and how are they interpreting it through their lens. Students, students haven't grown into the world yet, right? But what are the needs they're expressing and how do they think they, they can serve those needs? So in other words, I start by listening, um, not by telling them what they need. And, and build that community, get more than one faculty member in the room talk with each other because then there's new information being shared, right? Um, and, and, ex and extending that conversation. And then maybe you can get to easing in with more information about uh, MC and other databases that is a tool used to facilitate conversations. That's the thing about these tools. You're, you're not going to get an answer for what the skills are that you need to deliver or, or what the skills are that a particular student you need to tailor this for. That's not what these tools are for. They're more for expanding the conversation beyond what you've started with. So that's my point. Faculty are going to come in and have a relatively limited uh, starting point, but then expand that. Bring in other faculty, then bring in the database, and kind of build a base. Maybe career services, bring them in to start out someone that has some broader information, but, but ask them to politely listen first, <laughs> and, and, then, and then bring the networks together. I really, I really like the idea of asking questions. So I wonder if... You know, my world is 60 by 30 text, so I, that's, <laughs> that's all I know. Um, <laughs> well, it might be interesting, though, if you could invite administrators to just talk about 60 by 30 text in general, using these data as a leverage point. Um, would a conversation about student debt be, be more palpable? Could you start there and ask, what else do you see in this report? Like, do you think that where our students are being placed um, puts them in a position to pay off their debt? Or... These are where our completers are going. I mean, just wondering, could you come at it from another angle and then ask them what else do they see? Because the skills are there. They're going to see them. And could that then move into a conversation about marketable skills if your concern is that it's not a subject that is desirable, um, which I totally understand. Um, I, hope, I hope it doesn't stay that way. <laughs> um, but I, that's a wondering that I have. I honestly don't know. Uh, you know your peers and what might work. It's also an opportunity for partners, you know, if you have employer partnerships or industry partnerships, to bring them in and have a conversation about what they see as valuable, whether it's the positive instances of, oh, here's some people that came from your school that are really great at, you know, teamwork, and they, they're really essential to the organization in terms of X, Y, and Z skills. That's a valuable thing maybe for faculty to hear, certainly valuable for students. I know our students... You know, to some level, they think, oh, you're a professor, you're not in the real world. Then you bring people in from the real world, and they're saying things that you've said all along about these soft skills being important. Um, so that, that can be useful, too, to expand beyond, beyond academia. Um, I, I just have a broad question. Uh, I represent a College of Humanities and Social Sciences, and, um, you know, we've been talking about broad skills or soft skills and uh, very hard skills and so forth. And I'm wondering if there are any institutions that are four-year institutions that are in the liberal arts or those colleges or schools that might be adopting uh, certificates uh, mm. that have specific office skills. For example, you mentioned Microsoft popped up and Excel yeah. popped up several times. And especially in things like the social sciences, some sort of data certificate to put on a transcript. I know we've my particular institution, we've talked about this, but I don't know if any institutions in Texas have actually adopted this. Any, I, I yeah. do, you, do you have, do you want to speak to this? Right, yeah, we just heard a presentation this morning from U of H who are doing something through, through um, um, several different Departments. It, it will be on video for you to watch at a later mm -hmm. time. Um, but I, I, we do know um, UT Austin presented to our board um, last year on something called Bridging Disciplines. Uh, I recommend you, you look up that program um, where they offer, um, you know, a student has a major, but they can get a certificate or something in a, in a different program. And they're built it in such a way that they're not getting any excess credit hours. 
um, the way the program is designed. And so, for example, um, they encourage liberal arts majors to, say, get a, a certificate in business, something yeah. that would give them that extra push, just like Peter Stokes was talking about. Liberal arts skills are in high demand in the workforce. Sometimes they just need that extra infusion of skills, of, of more applied skills, to make them for employers to see their, the, high, the real value of, of that liberal arts student. Yeah, the, um, both education and industry, they're exploring this landscape of, um, you know, MOOCs didn't seem to work, but now we're looking at certificates, we're looking at micro-credentialing, mm -hmm. um, and, and certainly certification has existed for a long time, and so that's a, it's a broad landscape. Um, in the liberal arts and social sciences, so I'm, I'm co-chairing a committee at Rice on this, uh, they, they had a data science initiative a couple of years ago startup. It was a $50 million investment, and there was a faculty hiring side, and I'm on the education curricular side of things. And so uh, we are introducing, eventually, a data science minor that involves quantitative skills, that then also involves data visualization and communication, communicating the results, not just analyzing it. And then ethics, right? Go figure. Ethics with Cambridge Analytica in the news and everything. That's uh, good timing on our part. We, we, we have an ethics component that is totally critical to what we've been developing. And so we imagine that and hope that that will lead to more marketable students who do major in the social sciences. Um, if anything, it assuages some of the concerns of parents <laughs> who worry about their students majoring in liberal arts sometimes. Uh, but really, we think uh, there, there is a demand um, by students and by employers for these skills, um, so to your point. So we are working on that. It's not a uh, certification, it's a minor, but I, I think these things will grow organically. We, we, do, we do now have certifications at Rice, and, and maybe some offshoots will happen in the data science domain. The humanities is very interested in this too, like the medical humanities in particular. And we mentioned um, Calibrate from TSTC, the, the model that they're building. And they're, they're in um, beta testing right now, and they are actually contracted with um, some uh, humanities departments at other, at other institutions not in Texas because they're very interested in using that tool to uh, demonstrate the, the value of their, their uh, graduates. So I definitely recommend you, you investigate Calibrate as well. Um, if you, do, if you don't mind, Fred, I'd love for us to dig into the exercise because it really speaks to the question you sure. just asked, Marie. Like, how do you have that conversation? And so the tool kind of walks you through what might happen on your campus. Um, I'd love if you were sitting at a table by yourself, if you might consolidate with another table so you can talk through um, what, what you might do and get some ideas from your peers. Um, we, you know, again, we're really thinking of these LMI, these labor market information data, as, as a place to start a conversation, um, as a as sort of a leverage point. We don't want this to be the stick that Ellen had talked about this morning. Um, we just want it to be a place to provide information to your to your peers, your colleagues, to help you lead a conversation about what might our marketable skills look like for our programs. Um, like I said, UT Tyler did this by meta major. That's a perfectly acceptable approach. But you know what will work with your campus. You know your leadership. So let's take a few minutes to work through the exercise, and then we'll reboot in about 15 minutes. <laughs> disrupt your conversation because it looks like a lot of people are still really having a, um, a lot of thoughtful conversations based on the exercise. We have about seven minutes left. So um, does it, Fred, what would you like to do? You want to see if there's any last minute questions or any, any questions after you've done the exercise now that you've thought a little bit more? Uh, I can just say from, from walking around, I want to reiterate what I shared with um, some folks. So this is 
a way to approach the marketable skills goal. It is not the way to approach the marketable skills goal. If you learn about the possibility of using labor market information today and you recognize that will not work on your campus, it will not work with your faculty, but thanks for the information, that's an acceptable outcome. Because again, we are just wanting to introduce you to possible methods for you to start the conversation. Um, but we would ask that think about maybe it doesn't, you don't need this for your program, but if, are there other programs on your campus that might benefit from these data as a starting point to the conversation? Because again, it has to be the starting point and then, and then you gotta in, involve faculty in the conversation and if they wanna nix any of the, the skills, you know, you'll have to think about doing that. Yes. I'm going to bring the mic so you get, so just so your voice, uh -huh. no, it's just because uh, your voice won't show up on the recording. Well, I'm a faculty at a community college in Dallas, and one idea I had when we were thinking about faculty is we're on these guided pathways, and rather than looking at each course individually, let's take the whole pathway and say, what skills are we learning mm -hmm. throughout the pathway? And if we're missing some, encourage students to take those as electives. If your path doesn't have oral communication, then be sure you take that. Um, it's just a thought. And, and that's, that's an excellent idea. Um, so the marketable skills goal, by 2030, all students will graduate from Texas public institutions um, with, from programs with identified marketable skills, from programs. So this is not a course level um, goal. It is a program level goal. And I think that's an excellent idea if you can, if a student has laid out their pathway and you recognize that somewhere along the way they're not quite hitting all of the marks they could to be the most marketable that they could, if you could advise them to, to take a, a course to supplement that. I think that would be a really terrific way to move forward. Um, so thank you for that and thank you for coming because mm -hmm. we don't often have faculty at our conferences, so that's great. <laughs> um, any other comments or questions? Yes, I'm sorry. I'm going to dash over there. Thank you. Just uh, quickly, I was wondering if the uh, board, the uh, coordinating board or any of my friends and colleagues here have given any thought to how we are going to meet uh, the needs of students who may need additional courses in order to develop these marketable skills in terms of financial aid and remedial courses, like if you have good students but they may need to brush up on writing or public speaking or, or you know, just a, a plethora of skill development courses, but you don't want to push out and you cannot push out the 120-hour degree plan, you can't add to financial aid, you don't want to create mm -hmm. a burden trying to fix something. So any, any uh, you know, is, are they, what are your thoughts on that? So, uh, well, first, I really uh, appreciate that, <laughs> given my own uh, uh, journey through college and, you know, struggles that people have. But, um, you know, one thought I have is how this isn't, it's not like you're necessarily introducing new marketable skills into the curricula, sometimes it means it's already there and reminding the instructors that you have it there. Did you know that you were, communic you were already teaching teamwork, you were already dealing with ethics, and now that you know about it, can you amplify that marketable skill a little bit more because we do have this mission? And so, in other words, in order to get faculty buy-in, you know, you might, you might be reluctant at first and say, I don't want to approach them with this new thing. It's, no one wants another thing to do. But can you take what's already there and, and amplify it for them? Say, it's already there. What can you build to add to this? Here's our program goal, maybe our program pipeline, if there's a strategic pipeline for it. But then you're not paying extra, you're getting extra for enhancing what's in there. Does that kind of get at what you're saying? I mean, are, are you suggesting there's additional demands potentially that require... Uh, I'm, I think I am. <laughs> when you've been around schoolhouses a long time, you've heard of things like reading across the curriculum, writing across the curriculum, learning communities. You've heard so many ideas 
And I think the um, impetus for them is because there are skills that are missing. And mm -hmm. we're actually trying to fortify and, and uh, uh, skills, skill sets. Mm -hmm. But I think of marketable skills, if I, if I have in mind what the coordinating board had in mind, then there are some in this 60% of Texas citizens that will need um, writing courses. They'll need articulation. You know, they're just so, yes, sir, I believe you're right. I know you're right. They are teaching. We're teaching them, but maybe if we can ask faculty to amplify or right. reinforce in certain courses, you know, like introduce in... Freshman year, reinforce in sophomore year. I'm not sure what the plan is, but some students need us to help them to articulate, to gain and articulate. You know, I would say if, if you can build community within the school around these skills, you know, there, there, there may be different starting points, but you approach it as a community and say, okay, we're already teaching you know, some writing here, can you amp it up? Or here's another course that doesn't have any writing. Could you actually incorporate some writing and actually help the course and also the marketable skills, by the way? There's some questions. So uh, let me just add, add to that um, from the coordinating board's perspective. Um, we are not asking you to add additional skills to your programs. We are really just asking you to identify the skills you're already conferring. When you had the idea of suggesting a course, I am, assumed you were talking about within the degree plan, like not adding anything into addition, in, in addition to that, because we don't want to inflate the credit hours for students. Um, so I would start by just identifying the skills you're already teaching. Um, and then if you feel like there's places where things need to be enhanced or amplified, that's a conversation to have with advisors and career services. I would, after you've identified the marketable skills. I, I would just start there with what you're already doing, which is exactly what, what Fred was talking about. There are three things that just came about. I also think it's important to think about this from a program perspective. It's not a course-by-course course issue. It's a program perspective. And if you have to have a course for everything that you want to teach, there's no way we can fit in 120 hours. So, so rather, it's portions of things that happen along the way. A significant portion, I think, of what happens with our students, and I'm not going to go to translating to the marketplace yet, but for our students, is our students don't know that they know that. So in my college, I teach in a school of business. So I'm weird, right? I'm not like most of you here. Uh, and, well, in the sense that our marketable, our marketable skills are sort of, a, sort of a, more in line with, the, with, with what those, those things say up there. But we... Uh, we assess directly whether they, for example, measure uh, how well they do in critical thinking or how well they do in oral presentation skills. We also survey indirectly the students. And the question we ask is how confident you are about your, your presentation skills. And we find that often in many areas, our students meet our target benchmarks for what they actually know, but don't meet their their confidence levels. So what I've started doing in my own classes and when I teach is I tell students, especially for a difficult exercise that they don't want to do, I tell them why we do that exercise. The reason we do this exercise, the reason you hate this exercise, but you need it is because you still don't know how to work in teams and you don't feel confident about working in teams. So are you going to have a laggard in your team that pills you down? Yes, as we all do in everyday life. Right, And so you need to learn how to work with it. And you can't fire the person because you're not the manager. right? And things of that sort. So by telling students why you're doing difficult exercises, you begin the translation of the marketable skills so that the student can understand it. Maybe we can do that with the employer next. Yes, that was great. Well, thank, thank you. I want to really uh, uh, thank Fred for his time. Uh, I really had to sweet talk him into doing this. Hey, thanks. Um, I appreciate it. Um, if you ever want to reach me, I, and Please do so. I really mean it. Uh, my email address is foswald, F-O-S-W-A-L-D, at rice.edu. Happy to continue the conversation and talk shop. And by the way, I'll send you all this vendor information that I've gathered. Um, one point that was brought up is it would be nice. We have this community here. 
we're helping each other out. You know, can we connect and create better standards? So maybe we're not using different vendors. That's, that may be a long-term goal for now. Uh, but each vendor offers different advantages and disadvantages for you and your goals. But um, so take a look at them. But let's continue this conversation. Let's continue to work together. And uh, thanks for having me. I really yes. appreciate it. Thank it was, you. It was fun. Thank yes. You.